Hi students, welcome to the first part of the chapter 6 lecture. We're moving right along here. Um, I hope you're all able to keep up with the pace of this course. Um, anyway, if you have any questions about due dates, please first check the syllabus, and you can also email me if you have any questions. Um, we're going to get through this chapter as well as chapter 7 by the end of this week, and then we're going to move right along into chapter 8 um, by the beginning of next week. Okay, so this chapter is all about cellular respiration, which is the process by which our cells harvest energy from the food that we take in. This is a great example of an organism that is using cellular respiration in order to power its flight muscles. Yes, it's kind of weird to think of bees as having muscles, but they do. They have tiny little muscles that are able to power those wings. This particular bee is a carpenter bee, which are not very well liked around here um, because they can damage wood buildings and basically anything made out of wood that is left outside. They'll drill into it, lay an egg inside, and um, raise their young up within that wood item. Okay, so for chapter 6, our outcomes are key players um, having to do with cellular respiration, chemical cycling, cellular respiration. Um, the first stage of cellular respiration is glycolysis. The second stage is the citric acid cycle. And the third stage is the electron transport chain. Okay, let's um, define a few terms before we get into the main part of this chapter. So autotrophs are plants and other organisms that make their own food. These are also known as producers. Um, when you think of auto, you might think of autobiography. That basically means a biography written by the self. Um, when you think autotrophs, it literally means self-feeding. And these organisms are able to take um, inorganic material like minerals and gases from the atmosphere and transform those um, raw materials into usable carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. A great example of an autotroph, of course, is a plant. All they need um, is a suitable soil base with minerals, a sufficient supply of water and sunlight in order to make all of their own food. And of course, these are the basis of most food chains. We also have um, algae and some protists that are also able to make their own food. In contrast, heterotrophs are organisms that consume other organisms in order to survive. And these are also known as consumers. They ultimately rely on autotrophs for survival. And this, of course, is true of ourselves and many other animals. Um, fungus, of course, fun fungi cannot make their own food. They have to rely on um, microorganisms in the soil and um, dead and decaying matter, but they, but they can't photosynthesize. Um, of course, there's herbivores that make up the primary producers of the food chain, and then there are carnivores that will consume those herbivores, but ultimately you can trace most food chains back to the primary consumers, also, or sorry, the primary producers, which are typically plants. Producers are um, essential for being able to store chemical energy via photosynthesis. They basically are able to capture chemical energy from the sun by photosynthetic processes. And again, that is the basis of most food chains as we know them. So they not only store chemical energy, via photosynthesis, but they also harvest that energy via cellular respiration. 
Producers will use sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water in the photosynthetic process, and they will produce sugar and oxygen in that process. Consumers, on the other hand, use sugar and oxygen in cellular respiration, and they produce carbon dioxide and water as byproducts. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that producers also use cellular respiration. So it's not like consumers are the only ones undergoing this process of cellular respiration. Producers also use cellular respiration to harvest that energy that they capture with photosynthesis. And um, these two processes of cellular respiration and photosynthesis are intimately linked to one another, and the next chapter that we'll cover is going to go over photosynthesis. So you'll see the similarities and differences in these two different um, processes. But this is a nice little overview of that. We have photosynthesis and cellular respiration linked here in this cycle. Sunlight, of course, is going to be entering the ecosystem. There are going to be specialized organelles within plant and algal cells that are able to convert that sunlight energy into um, energy that can be stored by the plant. Um, this process of photosynthesis produces glucose, which is C6H12O6, as well as oxygen. And then, interestingly, those two um, substances are what are required during cellular respiration. So we have the plants themselves and then all links in the food chain um, undergoing cellular respiration which requires oxygen and glucose. Those two substances will make ATP which is that universal cellular um, currency that ATP in turn will drive cellular work. And of course, we also have heat exiting the system as a byproduct. Um, and as, as other byproducts of cellular respiration, we have water as well as carbon dioxide. And see how this is a nice cycle. It just links back up to photosynthesis because what do plants need in order to photosynthesize? They need carbon dioxide and water, and of course sunlight. But we breathe out carbon dioxide, the plants take in carbon dioxide via tiny pores in their leaves, which are called stomata, and then they produce the things that we need to eat. Um, so it's quite a nice little cycle there. Okay, so here we have the overall equation for cellular respiration. We can define cellular respiration as the aerobic harvesting of chemical energy from organic fuel molecules. Aerobic just means requiring oxygen. So oxygen must be present for this process to occur. And the function, of course, is to generate ATP for cellular work. This is a very important concept to keep in mind as we're getting more into the details of how cellular respiration works, just keep in mind that our ultimate goal here is to generate ATP. Cellular respiration should not be confused with respiration. We can think of respiration as just the process of breathing. However, on both the organismal level and the cellular level, Respiration involves taking in the gas of oxygen and expelling the gas, carbon dioxide. So yes, we breathe in oxygen. Yes, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Um, and our individual cells also take in oxygen and expel carbon dioxide. So respiration, both types of respiration, are similar in that regard. Interestingly, every molecule of carbon dioxide that you exhale during breathing was originally formed in your own mitochondria. Okay, so 
what exactly is oxygen's role in cellular respiration? It's basically an electron acceptor. Redox reactions are reactions that transfer electrons. So they transfer electrons from one molecule to the next. Um, redox stands for oxidation reduction, and oxidation refers to the loss of electrons during a redox reaction. Reduction refers to the gain of electrons during redox reactions. Which, it sounds counterintuitive here, how are you gaining when you're reducing? Well, remember, what charge does an electron carry with it? An electron carries a negative charge. So if you're gaining an electron, whatever is gaining that electron is actually being reduced in charge. So that's why it's called reduction. Sorry, I kind of skipped over that. Okay, so a simple redox reaction occurs when hydrogen gas combines with oxygen gas to form water. And energy is released as the electrons fall into their new bonds with oxygen. So we have hydrogen gas coming together with oxygen gas. There's going to be a release of heat energy, and water is going to form as a result of that. Okay, so again, here's the overall equation for cellular respiration. We have glucose plus oxygen, a series of chemical steps here, chemical reactions. The final products are carbon dioxide and water. So what is ultimately happening here is glucose is undergoing oxidation. Glucose is going to be losing electrons as well as hydrogens in order to um, go from C6H12O6 to just CO2, it's going to be losing all of those hydrogens there. And with it are going to go electrons. Um, oxygen here is being reduced. In order to go from O2 to H2O, it has to gain hydrogens. So it's gaining hydrogens as well as gaining electrons, so it is undergoing a reduction. Okay, another crucial step in this cellular respiration process is this molecule known as NADH. This is the initial electron acceptor. Remember, overall, when we look at this equation, equation. <laughs> wow. Okay. Overall, when we look at this equation, electrons need to get from glucose to oxygen. Electrons need to be transferred from glucose here to oxygen in order to get to these final products. NAD plus is a positively charged electron acceptor that is made from niacin, which is a B vitamin. When an electron is transferred to NAD+, it is reduced to NADH. Remember, when it gains a hydrogen, it's also gaining electrons, and it is being reduced. So you go from NAD+, to NADH. This process represents one step in the journey from glucose to oxygen. The rest of the process of cellular respiration consists of an electron transport chain, which um, can also be abbreviated as ETC or etc. It's like you can actually say cellular respiration is just basically getting electrons to NAD+, etc. Okay, I have no idea why it's doing that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pause here, and I will pick up where I left off.